You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Sitting there in his Watford t-shirt in his Watford home. Not Watford home, but a Watford t-shirt, yes. You're not yeah. Watford home. Well, you should have a not Watford t-shirt on then. We should all wear <laughs> t-shirts identifying where we are in this age of remote recording. Are you not wearing your tooting t-shirt? I don't well, actually I have that not. on. No, oh, I don't sorry. have that Is Daniel on. wearing his Coventry t-shirt? <laughs> I'm not in Coventry. <laughs> London. You haven't be, been to Coventry be for a long time. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be sent to Coventry if you're not careful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was the voice of Daniele Friberancini. Hello, Daniele. <laughs> Hello, Richard. You fool. Oh, you me. complete fool. Anyway. <laughs> oh, 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 that's uh, this has taken a turn for the worse already, hasn't it? Dear me. Um, what's wrong with that, Daniel? Identifying you by your name. Well, people who have only recently started listening to the podcast might actually start thinking that that is my name, which is concerning. Um, there, was, there was a law passed in, I don't know whether it was passed, but sort of unveiled in Germany yesterday. The first time um, you've ever been able to sort of change your name, really, with any sort of ease in Germany, as of yesterday. Um, right? double barreled names. I mean, there are double barreled names in German, but um, you can't sort of, it, you, or you couldn't until yesterday sort of, um, give yourself a double-barreled name if you marry someone with a, a different name, but now you can. So it's a similar, not similar, but in France, uh, when for baby names, there's a, a an approved list, isn't there? That you've Correct. Got to from. Same. It, there was such a thing in Germany as well. Yeah. So you don't get like Chardonnay or names like that entering into the lexicon of baby names. Beaujolais. <laughs> oh, don't mention Beaujolais. Beaujolais. Oh. Why not? Oh, I'm not a big fan. Anyway, we should crack on. Chats. Cycling, cycling. Well, well, hang on. I mean, yeah. how how are we how are we all doing? Been on the turbo trainer this morning, Lila. Theme, isn't it, of any cycling related chat? Lots of turbo training going on. Um, I, I was on mine this morning, uh, and uh, quite, that's been one of the the nice things actually. It's been having a bit of time and being in one place to be able to get fitter than I am when you're allowed to go outside strangely no pictures from listeners I asked for them last week and we haven't had any I don't think pictures of listeners on improvised turbo trainers slash uh, rollers fashioned from four bottles of wine and I was even I even helpfully um, gave people instructions on what kind of wine they should use they should be using some Bordeaux shaped bottles rather than Rhone Valley or Burgundy shaped bottles which you know have a, a sort of steeper curve or well, more of a actually more of a kind of gradual curve and would be more dangerous i think you do well you do realize just how difficult this would actually be <laughs> the reason know. we've not had any pictures is because it may well have proved impossible and may, or may well extremely have, dangerous may well have claimed several fatalities we're 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 very fortunate richard to have our smart trainers of course um just to give a little plug for the next episode of explore that's coming up yesterday i spoke to a young man in walthamstow who goes by the name tour de flat on twitter um that's not his actual name that's not his actual name um you 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 can listen to his uh, explanation of what he's doing in the next episode of explore but he had he set himself the target of riding three thousand five hundred kilometers indoors which was last week i joked that you could ride the whole route of the giro in may on your turbo richard and you scoffed. yeah and I, and I got a call a phone call a day or so later from matt rendell our colleague um asking me if as he'd heard i was riding the entire route of the giro on my turbo trainer so i, I said that it, literally i said you might manage the prologue in hungary or the mm-hmm. opening stage in Hungary. Anyway, this uh, this chap is riding 3,500 kilometres on an exercise bike that he bought a few years ago in Argos. He's not even got a turbo trainer. He set himself a, an incredible challenge. Um, he's doing around about 50 or 60 kilometres on it a day, um, trusting that the digital display on the, uh, the handlebars is, uh, is accurate. Um, and he hopes to raise 5,000 quid for big issue sellers who at the moment cannot sell the big issue outdoors because, of course, uh, it's not safe 
uh, with this with the social distancing restrictions it's not safe for people to be outdoors so their sole source of income big issue sellers for those who don't know it's a it's a magazine that supports um homeless people um so yeah a, a great ride for a great cause but when he sent me through a picture of his uh, exercise bike i I did sort of wince slightly because it doesn't look the most comfortable thing to be riding. But more about that in the next episode of Explore. Turbo well, trainers have sold yeah. out more or less, haven't they, in the United Kingdom? Uh, I've read somewhere the other day. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, they That's one industry that will be doing doing okay, I, I guess. Um, but that could also be propaganda, couldn't it? If you hear that something's almost sold out, you're more likely to go out and buy it true but we're we're all doing okay are we we're all we're all feeling you know the the restrictions on our movement are not uh not denting morale too much personally i mean i feel a bit like it's it's been the world's longest stage race that we've signed up for and i'm just relieved to get through the first week without a crash or a puncture and now i'm taking it day by day the only problem is that um it does feel a little bit like quite a few days in a row are just a sort of 55 kilometer time trial um, with six feed zones. Yeah, I mean, it, it'd be like a stage race where you didn't, you know, you embarked on it without knowing how long it was or how how long it was going to last. That's the tricky part, isn't it? Difficult to pace yourself, isn't it? Just to take it day by day, as they say. Spoken the riders cyclists, are right, aren't they? Spoken to any cyclist chaps or, um, you know, I'm finding... Yes, yes, yeah. yes, spoken to a few cyclists. Um well, we'll hear from one of them in this week's episode, Alberto Bettiel, the winner of the Tour of Flanders last year, the EF Pro Cycling rider Italian, of course. Uh, he is from Florence originally, but lives in Switzerland now. And um, I spoke to him about mainly looking back on his victory last year. So we'll hear we'll hear from him. Um, what else have we got coming up in this week's episode? Well, before we move on, Chas, um, not a cyclist, but a story, cracking story from someone who used to manage a cycling team. So um, one of the people I have spoken to in the last week, John Worden, uh, used to be or used to manage the Mercury and became Mercury Viatel. Um, they were an American team which um, at a certain point decided they were going to try and break Europe. Um, in 2001, they signed up Peter Van Pettigam and, of course, my man, Pavel Tonkov, um, my idol. Um, anyway, John Worden told me this cracking story about Pavel Tonkov, probably the best Pavel Tonkov and Mark Wahlberg story you've ever heard. Um, apparently, before the 2001 Liege Baston Liege, um, Pavel Tonkov, who was a little bit high maintenance um, uh, I, I, for all his other virtues, um, he became very upset with one of the team mechanics because his stem was at the wrong height. And um, but this happened. This happened a few minutes before the start, which was obviously very inconvenient. An important race for Mercury. They were trying to get into the Tour de France. Um, another another sort of spanner in the works that day was that they had Mark Warburg, Marky Mark of um, Good Vibrations fame, in the team car. Um, he was at Liège Baston Liège because he was doing research. Um, He'd been earmarked to play Lance Armstrong in a, in a Hollywood film um, in 2001. One of several, I think, Lance Armstrong films that never saw the light of day. Um, anyway, so he was in the Mercury team car and they were about to sort of set it off to the start. And Pav, Pavel Tonkov, comes back and starts throwing a, a bit of a, a sort of hissy fit and come a sort of bridezilla moment about his stem. And this was Marky Mark's first ever experience of European cycling. And the race started and Pav Tonkov was um, was still stuck there fiddling with his stem um, for about 10 minutes before before he set off in pursuit of the peloton. Daniel, you got you went quite wobbly need when we uh, when we saw Pavel Tonkov at the Giro a couple of years ago. Yep. <laughs> Likewise, didn't we? Didn't we see him also in a restaurant near Udine? Uh, certainly, we in did, Friuli, no wasn't it? We yeah, did. and you, you couldn't you couldn't concentrate on your appetizer. It was quite. It was. It was. It was as if um, as if we were on a date and you'd seen an ex girlfriend at another table. You were completely <laughs> distracted. I didn't know. I couldn't get your attention at all. <laughs> well, that's with, another with one for the series for my chance encounters series. I think. Fantastic. Uh, just, fantastic just on the Mercury team. Tom Kov and, and Mark Wahlberg as well. That's fantastic <laughs> cheekbones. He would have been a good Lance Armstrong, actually. 
Sorry, Lionel. Floyd Landis, of course. Floyd Landis, of course, uh, turned pro for that Mercury team in '99. Rode for them for the first three years of his career and uh, had his kind of breakthrough successes with Mercury. But John Warden was a was an extraordinary, is an extraordinary character. I've not spoken to him for years, but um, he he really had big dreams, big visions for that Mercury team. But it all it all went a little bit Linda McCartney. Um, sort of imploded didn't it really it kind of well certainly came to a fairly abrupt halt and uh, all, all the riders had to find alternative teams well listen I, w- I said that we've got we're going to hear from Alberto Bettiol last year's Tour Finders winner and um, we're also going to be discussing the new six-part Netflix series following the Movistar team last year the least expected day it's called um, we're going to deal, as we did last week, with uh, the coronavirus news as it affects cycling um, kind of separately at the end of the episode. We've got an interview with uh, Paola Santini. Daniel spoke to her of the Santini Clothing Company um, who have uh, begun producing face masks. Um, we're going to hear from Larry Warbass again with his uh, Lockdown with Larry uh, audio diaries. We're going to hear a little bit from Mick Bennett as well, the organiser of the Tour of Britain, and of course, we'll hear once again from Francois Tomaso with his weekly song, and um, plus his own tribute to our memory of Gianni Mura, the great Italian journalist who died last week and who we remembered in last week's episode. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWaka, flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWaka. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk, iwoca.co.uk. So my name's Rory Black, and my role in Kendall Cycle Club is communication secretary. Kendall Cycle Club is kindly supported by iWalker. Essentially, it's to uh, to encourage uh, small business owners and their employees to uh, join Kendall Cycle Club. And obviously, the associated benefits of cycling um, is something that we're keen to uh, to promote. So, mental, physical health, and well-being, um, networking, just talking to other people that run small businesses, because there are a lot of people within the club that do um, either work as freelance or, or run their own small business. So, yeah, we just thought it was a fantastic idea. So, this is how we've uh, come to uh, to uh, work with Iwaka. A big thank you to our headline sponsor, Iwaka, who don't just sponsor the cycling podcast, but the Kendall Cycle Club, as we heard there. And we'll be hearing from some more members of a fine club doing some very fine work up there in the Lake District in the coming weeks. Iwaka's support helps ensure that we can carry on as normal in this strange period. Um, the company remains 100% focused on their mission to provide customers with the finance they need to bridge cash flow gaps and make investments. Thank you very much indeed to iWaka. Well, in this part, I think we're going to talk mainly about the Tour of Flanders, which would have been this weekend, this Sunday, of course. Um, we'd have we'd be coming off the back of E3 Harold Becker on uh, Friday, or the E3 Bink Bank Classic, I think it might be known as now. Is that right, Lionel? You're shaking your head. That is right, yeah. And Ghent Wevelgem on Sunday, and uh, we'd be right in the middle of the kind of Flanders period of classics, Tour of Flanders this weekend. Um, so in the absence of that, I mean, we were going to turn our thoughts back to last year's race and Alberto Bettiol's win. And it's funny now because, I mean, last week I rewatched Milan San Remo and Bettiol was, was quite impressive in that race. He attacked on the Poggio. You know, there were there were little clues that he was going extremely well. And I think a lot of us had seen him coming slowly over a couple of years. A couple of years ago at the Tour, he rode extremely well as well. And um, maybe more surprising is that after the Tour of Flanders, he didn't really kick on. He didn't, he didn't, he kind of disappeared, you know, as far as most of us were concerned for the rest of the year. So I was keen to speak to him about, you know, his win and, and what it meant and how he did it, but also how he dealt with the aftermath of the win, because that was my impression. I don't know, Daniel, you um, follow Italian riders, Italian cycling very closely. Um, you know, what were your thoughts, Luca? first of all, at his win, but also at Betty, the Betty all that we saw the rest of last year? 
Well, I think we talked quite a bit last year, didn't we, after Flanders, about how he's a rider who um, has had a bit of a, an atypical career in the sense that, well, he, he turned pro very young and um, was a very highly rated junior mainly. Um, he didn't spend much time in the under-23 ranks before he turned professional with liquid gas. And the first couple of years, were, well, if you judged them solely by results, were very, very poor to the extent where it looked as though he was a sort of fish out of water. But people people in the know said that, um, you know, he was a very talented rider and that he'd, I mean, he had just taken the decision along with um, his manager and coaches that he was going to sort of go in very slowly to his pro career and treat the first couple of years almost as though he was still an under 23 but doing a bit of work experience as a pro um so he he moved through the gears very slowly and then he started having better results and and um and better results in bigger races as well but he's always had this sort of characteristic that he's blown very hot or very cold and and we talked last year about the fact that he's he abandons races an awful lot i mean i looked at his record in classics um he's he's abandoned four amstel golds only finished twice he's abandoned Flanders twice and finished only twice he's abandoned Liège all three times that he's taken part um so he's someone who you know is not going to sort of battle it out to finish 15th when he's not on particularly good form um he's more likely to sort of get into the team car but um when he is good um he he can co- compete in a in a broad uh, range of races. I um, mean, someone who doesn't really have any any particular weaknesses. And yeah, with hindsight now, you can look back and say that throughout the the spring of last year, leading up to Flanders, he was entering one of those purple patches that he has had thus far in his career. After Flanders, I mean, I'm intrigued, Rich, or I was intrigued to hear what he what his view was because from the outside, it, it was easy to say, and it looked like someone who'd maybe struggled um, with entering a new dimension whether that was the sort of attention that he was uh, subject to his own expectations or or whatever it was but um, it certainly wasn't a particularly good second half of 2019 for him. Take take me back to that day I mean um, I watched the the Rafa sort of behind the scenes film and yeah. You, you weren't you were you know you were kind of optimistic at the start but you know you couldn't have imagined what would happen at what point in the race did you did you realize that you were on a really good day no no i'm uh, i'm honest i never never thought that uh, that that day would be mine because uh, we are still talking uh, tour of flanders so tour of flanders is one of the most important race in the world one of the most uh, uh, um, 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 ambitious race uh, everybody want to win that race we, we used start uh, in the morning uh, with a, a bunch of champions a bunch of riders that uh, um, they won already a lot of things so I was confident on myself uh, because I I did uh, a really good approach to to Tour of Flanders, uh, starting from uh, Tirreno Adriatico, Milan Sanremo, and uh, and again Arelbeck, no, when I finished fourth. So I was pretty sure to do to do a big race, and uh, what what I expected was uh, to finish the race and saying. Uh, I gave um, I give my 100 percent because uh, as I said already in Tour of Flanders sometimes it's difficult to to express yourself uh, in 100 uh, percent because uh, you you can find a lot of uh, inconvenience uh, thing like uh, flat tires crashes uh, uh, maybe you are too far back in the peloton so um, that's that's my that was my hope. Uh, and also when I attacked, uh, I was I was feeling really strong, but I never thought to drop everybody uh, out and arrive alone. And even uh, when I had 5k to go or even 1k to go, I still had uh, 15 seconds. I still never believe uh, I was waiting for me to, to catch uh, in uh, some ways because I, I was not believing... Uh, what I, what I was doing so basically 
basically I realized uh, I won Flanders just uh, 100 meters to the finish line when I turned back. You had a, a strong team uh, that day. I mean, Seth Van Mark was was in an earlier move. He's obviously very experienced in these races. Sebastian Langeveld as well. Were they able to encourage you and help you during the race? And and was it how much you know of a difference did it make to you to just know that they were there? Uh, we started uh, that race with uh, with two captains, me and Sebastian. And uh, Sepp Van Mark was just a jolly because he came from a hard week after the after crash in, in uh, Arelbeck. He didn't uh, he didn't train almost all the week because he had a knee pain. But he arrived in, in Tour of Flanders, uh, and his goal was just to just to try to help the team as far as he could. And uh, in the end, he did an amazing, amazing race. Also, because for him, Tour of Flanders is much, much more important than that. Uh, that me, because he, he comes from that region, he comes from uh, that areas. He grew up with uh, with the smell of uh, Paterberg, Quaremont. So for him, is uh, is the key moment of the year uh, with Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix. So in the end, and all the other teammates. Uh, they were confident uh, with me and Sebastian because we showed uh, that uh, we, we we can really win, no? Uh, and we can uh, we were so close. Sebastian was coughed by uh, I mean 500 meters to the finish in Gant Bevelgem. Me, I was fourth in uh, Arelbeck. So um, everybody was were super confident that we will we will do. Um, a really good race. Um, Sebastian, in particular, in the final, in the really final, uh, sometimes, a uh, few times, he speak at the radio to me, saying, uh, "Come on, Alberto, here there is no, there, nobody was is working, so we almost stopped. Keep on pushing, keep on pushing, and uh, was was really nice, no? Give me." some extra motivation to, to keep on fighting because uh, I did almost half an hour alone after 250k so mm, <laughs> that... even my energy they were not uh, a lot <laughs> yeah just just I mean getting that information from him and, and knowing that he was going to be marking people trying to disrupt the chase a bit that must have made a huge difference as you were out there on your own yeah of course uh in that in that uh, in that situation uh, more the legs more or less are the same for everybody so i think uh, what 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 makes the difference is the is the is the mind is the what you think if you think oh where are, where i'm going to do uh, where i'm going to go no, it's too far and then you sit down and you wait uh, Tour of Flanders is not a race where you, if you wait, you win. No, I think Tour of Flanders you have to 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 do something crazy, no? To to throw the hat away. That's how we said in Italy, no? And to see and to face, you have to you don't have to be scared about anything because sometimes uh, sometimes uh, uh, even in the past, no? I remember. In the in the in the recent uh, edition, oh, Gilbert, uh, Nikki Tepstra, they all they also make some crazy stuff because uh, you cannot wait till the end. Mm. Um, this is uh, this is what what Flanders is, no? If you are scared about Flanders, uh, you you sometimes you don't even finish Flanders because uh, stress in the peloton is super super high, crashes. Uh, really, really fatigue, fatigue, no efforts. So, have you? Um, I wondered if I've watched watched the race back again today. Have you watched it much on on YouTube? Is that a, a source of motivation for you? <laughs> no, I I don't really watch uh, a lot of times the race, but of course, uh, and, and I hope. Uh, next week, uh, some Italian television, uh, some Italian channels uh, show again this race, and of course uh, I will I will watch again. 
Um, I feel I saw thousands of times, uh, also because all the social media, no, mm. uh, reposted the, the, my attack on uh, on Quaremont. That's for sure. But uh, since the beginning, no, I never. I never watched uh, after. <laughs> yeah, uh, what it was quite a, a celebration that you you had, and and you made a, a sign, you pointed to your eyes. What what was that? Um, who was that aimed at? That gesture at the finish? No, it was uh, was it was a gesture that um, you know I I was uh, I was going fast. I was uh, in a really good shape. I was all, always there. In the last months, and uh, nobody, nobody uh, recognized me. No, nobody considered me, or not nobody, but they—they they don't. I don't know. They don't. They don't see me a lot. So I, when I realized uh, I was going to win, uh, it, that's also for. Uh, for for these people but not only it's in general uh, for everybody you know for the people that maybe in the previous years don't really believe in me and maybe they said uh, something but in the end they they don't uh, accept uh, this thing so in general was uh, this victory of course is uh, for me for my team for the for everybody, you know, it, it pay paid back uh, all the works of uh, the the works we did in in the in that in that week and, uh, with all the, all the team. But in general, it was also for for that people, no. And Alberto, something that happens uh, that obviously people in Flanders love cycling, and they they love riders who who love fl- the Tour of Flanders. Um, do you are you aware of a lot of support in Flanders for you? Is there an Alberto Betty old fan club in Flanders now? Ah, uh, not yet. I don't <laughs> have a fan club yet, but uh, I I I already I was already thinking to come back there in the, j- just walking, just uh, outside cycling, you no, know? just to come back where where all happened this winter. But then I. I, I didn't I didn't go to Belgium, but uh, this is uh, this is one of my dream, no, to come back in a silent day, you know, when I I can explore, uh, I can see, I can uh, imagine uh, what what I did really, no, where I was, because sometimes you you don't realize where you are, no, you you just you are just focused on. How many kilometers to the finish, and you just you you concentrate on where to stay on the cobbles, right, left, and uh, and then all the crowds, no, could, didn't allow you to to see all the all the Flemish area, no. And uh, yeah, and, you can go go back and drink some Belgian beer there one day. Of course, of I'm sure, course. I'm sure you won't have to buy it. I'm sure they'll buy it for you if you go there. Um, what, and what about the rest of the year last year? I mean, what was it like being a Tour of Flanders winner? Did that make racing harder or or easier? No, I I try I I try to to be back on 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 the same level as uh, as the seventh of April. Uh, but it was really hard for me. My my life changed, and uh, and uh, yeah, I had some. Some trouble, you know, to to manage all this attention. I, I as I always said, I passed from zero to one hundred in in half second, you know. So I have to reset everything, my life, my cycling uh, approach, uh, the attention. Uh, but uh, finally, I mean, I was happy that on on the words. In Yorkshire, I was I was I found again uh, the real Alberto Bettiol. I was feeling really good, and uh, and in the end, uh, I was pretty happy that uh, 2019 uh, season was over and start the, the new season because I make uh, a reset of my of that year of that win, 
what was important was uh, that, that my team, no, with the, the sport directors, the manager, and uh, the other sport directors, they take really, they took care of me. So they call me, they say, no problem, uh, uh, everything will be solved. I was, uh, I was uh, really focused on training, but I. I forget. I forgot maybe the most important thing. So the mind. I was not uh, free because uh, I can tell you that I won uh, Tour of Flanders because uh, I I wasn't thinking about anything. I was. Uh, I had a free mind. So no pressure. No. I I I could uh, make a mistake and nobody nobody care about it. After Flanders, I, I had I felt more responsibility, you know. So feeling more more uh, responsibility uh, means that you 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 are not uh, happy, you know, because you are scared to make a mistake. And uh, finally, I think this year, 2020, I found uh, I found back uh, this this really good feeling. Well, that was Alberto Betty, all remembering his Tour of Flanders win last year and also reflecting a little bit on some of the difficulties he had after that. Um, I, I was interested to hear him talk about, uh, you know, the the key to success in Flanders being that he raced with a, an empty mind, a mind free of any any kind of thoughts and, and that he struggled to achieve that, that state in, in in the second half of, of last year until the World Championships he said in Yorkshire where he felt that he'd rediscovered that, that state and that you know that, that that's really an, an interesting I, I, you know his, his turn of phrase is, is interesting isn't it um, and he clearly you know it's not it's go, it goes without saying it's ob- almost too obvious to say but it's not just about the body is it it's the it's the mind and uh, that on that day uh, he in Flanders he obviously found this this state of grace um, and it all just fell into place and came together for him but as you said earlier Daniel he's perhaps not a rider who's going to have those days on a regular basis but when he has them he may well pull off some pretty big victories isn't one of the th- things about a race like the Tour of Flanders and it's, it's it's goes for Paris-Roubaix to a degree as well is that uh, last year he was in a position where he, he wasn't one of the most watched most fancied riders and, and obviously take nothing away from the move he made on the uh, Quadamont but to solo to the finish owed a little bit to the hesitation behind as well from the, from the real top favourites because every now and again in a, an edition of the Tour of Flanders you get that situation where everyone's watching everybody else and somebody can sneak away i mean the the, the win um although it wasn't quite in the same way at all but you know nick noyens in 2011 definitely benefited from the fact that Cancellara and bonan were watching one another like hawks uh stein de Volder, a couple of years before that when he won his first was very much the kind of the the early move the decoy move for quick step and everybody just you know, were was more concerned with watching perhaps the more fancied favourites that were still in the group, and so that kind of uh, that kind of move that Betiol made, you know, bet, it wouldn't have been something that say Peter Sagan or Greg Van Avermaet or Oliver Narsen could have done on that day because they would have the reaction would have been immediate rather than um, you know well let's see how this develops is this going to be something that teases out a move from behind and while that isn't taking anything away from the move at all uh, for a rider like Betiol I think I'm right in saying that was his first pro win wasn't it the Tour Mm. of Flanders his first professional win quite extraordinary Um, but you can probably we may look back in a few years as as, as almost sort of before the Tour of Flanders and after because it's not the sort of ghost ghostly move or or, um, you know he won't benefit from that lack of attention uh, again because now he is a Tour of Flanders winner so you know those those races you know they benefit so much from um you know, seizing the moment and and really going for it. And and if Betio had nothing in his mind, because he had nothing to lose, really, he could commit everything to it. Whereas now he's a Tour of Flanders champion, it, it, that might change um, the way he thinks when when he's in a position. And just that sort of subtle additional pressure of of being a more watched rider. Um, unfortunately, we won't get to see that this spring. But when the racing resumes, it will be interesting to see. Um, you know how he kind of 
adapts to being a, a more high profile person I'm sort of torn when I think about where his career is likely to go from from here I mean you can look at his results and and the fact that for example as we just mentioned it was his first win and and those sort of checkered first years of his career and think that possibly winning Flanders last year was a was a flash in the pan but on the other hand you know you listen to people in the know um, in Italian cycling people who have followed his career people who who um, you know, worked with him as an under 23 and they say he's a guy with real pedigree um, you know who can do pretty much everything on a bike he can time trial he's a good bike handler um, he's not he's not slow um, so he's, he's not even someone who has to finish races so on his own which you know is, is something mm. which holds up a lot of a lot of the sort of one-time big winners um you know unless you you're reasonable you're reasonably fast in a four or five man group you're probably not going to be a regular winner of one day races but Bet- Betiol can win in that kind of um situation but um you know I think discipline in the sense of well weight I think um he's acknowledged in the past that that has been an issue for him at times that um, he struggles uh, at times to get down to his proper race weight. Um, he's also got a very hard taskmaster as a coach. I think um, he's coached by uh, Leonardo Piepoli um, of, well, some fame and some infamy, you have to say, in Piepoli's career. He's a, a climber for Benesto, um, Saunier Duval, most infamously, um, lat- in the latter part of his career. But Piepoli, um, I remember reading um, that the day after Flanders last year, Piepoli sent um, Betty a text message and it said, your career starts now. You can live off this for the next 10 years or you can become a real rider. The choice is yours. So um, pretty brutal. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> not, uh, not, even, not even a congratulations, great win. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned a few weeks ago Gianni Moscon being um, such a valuable rider because he can do everything and Betty all strikes me as similar in a sense although probably got a faster finish I think than uh, Moscon but he's that that similar he can climb um he can obviously ride these cobbled races as well and um yeah he's already a winner this year of course he won the time trial at Etoile de Bessege back in February um, one of so, the biggest races of the year well well <laughs> Absolutely, yes, Lionel. I can't argue with that. Um, actually, this morning on my Turbo Trainer, I watched the film of the 2017 Tour of Flanders. Um, this is a, a documentary they made for the first time for the 100th edition of the race, which was won by Peter Sagan a few years ago, and now it's become an annual tradition. Um, it's subtitled in, uh, in English now, and... Um, they show it on the eve of the Tour of Flanders each year, so they're getting through the subtitling of them this week and releasing them. You'll find it on YouTube. I actually was alerted to it by a a listener, David Pond, emailed us to tell us about it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a real sort of 360 view of the race. You're in a lot of the team cars. Um, you're with the some of the guys on motorbikes. Uh, the commentators, too, Rob Hatch and Rob Hales feature in it quite prominently. Um, as well as the the Belgian commentators, but you're in the the EF car quite a lot with Ken Van Mark and Andreas Clear, and that year they had Sebastian Langeveld in the in the front group, and Langeveld was complaining a lot about not being on a good day, and 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 Clear was telling him, Sebastian, you're in the you're in the you're deep into the Tour of Flanders, you're you know you're in the final sort of thirty forty k's Tour of Flanders, and you're in the front group, um, of course your legs are hurting. <laughs> It's quite funny, um, but I really recommend those films. As I say, that one, 2017, is available to watch now, and I think the others are going to be available this week. Rob Hatch is sending me the links to them, so we'll, well include we'll, them we'll, in our episode notes, won't we, Lionel? We will, yes. Uh, check out the episode notes for this episode. Any races that we talk about, we will uh, put a YouTube link if um, there's some good footage online for people to watch. Hi everybody, so uh, well this episode is about the Tour of Flanders and I thought, um, well I would sing a song by Jacques Brel Jacques Brel, well actually didn't like the Flemish too much I mean he wrote a couple of songs about Flanders and the Flemish uh, they, were, they were quite, how could I say, uh, derogatory I mean there's, you know, the little dispute there is between the Walloons and the uh, and the um, the Flemish, and um, in the same time, uh, Jacques Brel is from Brussels. But but in the same time, you know, 
after the years and years, Jacques Brel is now, I think, considered as a as a national icon by Belgians from all over. And he, he wrote that story and that song, and this great song, <clears throat> about the terrain on which the Tour of Flanders takes place and lots of the, uh, the Belgian races, but that's called the Flatland. Ce plat pays qui est le mien. You, you, you might object that uh, Tour of Flanders is not that flat. <laughs> There's a lot of hills. But by and large, uh, Brel is talking about the winds, the, these long stretches of uh, flatlands and these cathedrals uh, you know, that are the main summits of the country. And I think it actually uh, fits in pretty well uh, with, with the race we're talking about. So <clears throat> here we are. The song of the week is called Ce plat pays qui est le mien. Avec la mer du Nord Pour dernier terrain vague Et des vagues de dunes Pour arrêter les vagues Et de vagues rochers Que les marées dépassent Et qui ont à jamais Le cœur à marée basse Avec infiniment de brumes à venir Avec le vent de l'Est Écoutez-le tenir Ce plat pays Qui est le mien Avec des cathédrales pour unique montagne Et de noirs clochers comme mâts de cocagne Où les diables en pierre décrochent les nuages Avec le fil des jours pour unique voyage Et des chemins de pluie pour unique bonsoir Avec le vent d'ouest, écoutez-le vouloir Ce plat pays qui est le mien Avec un ciel si bas qu'un canal s'est perdu Avec un ciel si bas qu'il fait l'humilité Avec un ciel si gris qu'un canal s'est pendu Avec un ciel si gris qu'il faut lui pardonner Avec le vent du nord qui vient s'écarteler Avec le vent du nord, écoutez le craquer Ce plat pays qui est le mien And that's what it was, the plat pays qui est le mien, the flatland that is mine. And it was my, well, song contribution to uh, this week's Tour of Flanders. Uh, well, hopefully it'll be flatter than, you know, usual this year, because there won't be any race. But I hope the song, uh, you know, brought a little bit of, the, uh, well, memories from what uh, Flanders can be and uh, what it's going to be in the next, in the near future. Well, good day to all, uh, and looking forward to sing another th- song, maybe for Liege, Baston Liege. Cheers, guys. I'm Lizzie Banks, co-presenter of Service Course, the cycling podcast's monthly tech show. The tech show that is so much more than a tech show. Each month, Tom Wally and I delve into a different topic, getting insight from engineers and brands behind emerging tech, as well as hearing what the pro peloton really think about their and their opponents' tech. Make sure you never miss an episode by hitting subscribe on your podcast platform now. Well, can you explain that music, Lionel? I can. That is the iconic, I think we can use that word here, that's the iconic film music from Barry Norman's long-running um, film review program that that used to be on the BBC fairly late at night, ran for many, many years, from probably about the mid-70s through to, uh, well, fairly recently. I think Jonathan Ross took over as host after after the legendary Barry Norman, who had a bit of a catchphrase, didn't he, um, at the end of his film reviews, which was, and why not? I don't, I don't know where that came from, but that was, that was. Um, that Sounded was better from Barry phrase, Norman. A bit like that catchphrase. Well, of course <laughs> it did. Of course it did. I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend I'm Barry Norman, um, but we're going to be Barry Norman uh, collectively. Well, aren't you could we be now? Mark Kermode, maybe with a um, film review. I mean, our producer Tom produces Mark Kermode's uh, films podcast, doesn't he? So we're in, we're in great, indeed, great hands yeah. here. Um, but uh, yeah, well, we're we're turning our attention to the the Netflix series on Movie Star, which is uh, well, it was released on Friday uh, in, in in a oneer, all six episodes. It's called The Least Expected Day. Not really sure why it's called The Least Expected Day. Do you know why? It's I think our Least colleague our day? colleague Matt Rendell got this right on Twitter. I think he said the title um, didn't make it the whole way into English. Um, so right. It, 
Yeah, it's a little bit of a clunky Quite a lot. translation, yeah. which which applies, unfortunately, to I think a couple of the um subtitles as well on the english version i mean i yeah quite a lot doesn't make it all the way into english does yeah it? general but, school board yeah. instead of general classification which i thought was quite was quite sweet really and, mm. and you know we'll should be used that. going forward well you call it the you know the leaderboard in the clubhouse yeah. don't you that's mm. um yes in the grand the, the tours, series so. though um I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I thought the first episode was very confusing and I was trying to watch it with the eyes of a non-cycling fan and wondering what they would have made of it. It was it was all over the place, episode one, I felt. But then once we got into the Giro and it's sort of organised, well, the, the first one I think is supposed to be a, a general introduction to the some of the people and the races, but it then falls into a, a pattern of Giro tour Vuelta and they won the Giro of course of Richard Carapaz um, and I thought I, again I'd, I'd love to know what non-cycling fans make of it but I really enjoyed it for the insights into some of these people that we know so well and, and it, in a lot of ways it confirmed um, the impressions that we have of, of, of a lot of them, Eusebio Unzue the, the boss at Movistar, this gentle, calm, very likeable uh, guy um, Alejandro Valverde Mika Landa, uh, Naira Quintana, Mark Soler, Richard Carapaz, um, all feature in it quite a lot. And it, I found it um, really, really enjoyable, insightful. Um, and, you know, it's the latest in a quite a familiar type of series now, which is inside a team. And I mentioned in the last part the, the sort of 360 view that the Tour of Flanders film gives us of many different people and many different teams and so on. This is obviously very different. It's a narrow focus on one team, but and for all the the faults with that and the fact you don't get a, a rounded perspective, a whole view, um, I thought it was very, very good. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it, Rich. Um, my my initial impression was not altogether positive. Um, I, I found the first episode, as a lot of people have commented on, a little bit sort of fragmented, and um, I sort of took that idea I had of it um, into the rest of the series the first time round. Um, I thought. It, Perhaps it was a little bit rushed. It was sort of broad brushstroke, um, a, bit, a bit breathless at times. Um, and I found myself comparing it unfavorably to um, a couple of other documentaries. And um, the one we talked about a lot last year in the autumn of last year was um, Avec uh, Thibault, the documentary made by France Television about Thibaut Pinot's Tour de France last year, which um, was praised almost universally um, and had some very intense moments that were subsequently shared a lot on social media, clips of uh, Mark Maddio sort of consoling Thibaut Pinot after um, he pulled out of the Tour de France on the stage to team last year and, and Thibaut Pinot was uh, was obviously distraught at this. And, and um, yeah, they were very powerful moments and you know, there wasn't anything quite of that intensity in the Movistar um, series. Um, however, um, you know, I think the key difference there with Group Armour and Pino and that documentary was that, you know, you, you really felt as though you saw everything um, over the space of sort of seven or eight days in last year's Tour de France that mattered. And you felt that um, it was it was quite a forensic sort of emotional examination of what was going on in in a, a given um, situation which was that of the team um, at the Tour de France and whereas what you get in the Movistar series are a series of sort of glimpses um, from which you can kind of extrapolate and form your own ideas um, and a lot more or a lot less is, is sort of said and explained um, and, and there are these sort of tantalising flickers um, but you know having sort of thought about it more and gone back and watched some episodes again my impression of it was much more favourable and, and I found myself sort of appreciating that those kind of tantalising looks we get at some of the characters involved the the Quintanas and the Carapaz and Landa and and some of the the director sportives in particular as well um Jose Luis Arieta um Vicente Garcia Costa and Pablo Lastras and um you know I think I think it's it would be a mistake um, to draw too many conclusions based on the film about the way Movistar is run. Um, and, and, you know, we've criticised them and we've sort of joked 
um, quite a bit over the last couple of years about Movistar's shambolic tactics or Movistar being, um, people suggest that Movistar are, are old, school, old school, stuck in the past. And I've seen some reactions to the film which have said that, you know, this confirms that. I think that's that's too much of a of a stretch. You see, you know, you don't see much about the sports science at Movistar. You don't see much about, you know, necessarily the way they prepared for the Tour de France or the Giro or, um, uh, you know, you, you see footage of, of the riders being encouraged or sort of shouted at by director sportifs in team cars. But, you know, they're, they're um, fragments, really. Um, I think it's more important and entertaining and insightful as a character study, really, of those those f- few protagonists we mentioned. Every time I saw Mikel Landa, I was reminded of that. I remember that photograph that Kay Burley, the, the newsreader in the UK, posted of a dog um, with the caption, look at its sad eyes. I, I, I was reminded of that picture every time I saw poor old Mikel Landa. Yeah, I mean... You just want to give him a, you just want to give him a hug, don't you, Lionel? Well, yeah, I mean, he, he's just he's just never quite in the right place at the right time, is he? He's, he's, the, he's the guy who's been waiting at the bar for ages. He attracts the eye of the barman or barmaid, uh, and then somebody nips in ahead of him and orders an enormous round, and he's just sort of stood there with his 10-euro uh, note. Richard Carapaz goes off with a tray with and, 12 pints on yeah. it <laughs> and some cocktails. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I, I felt that... Um, that, that I've seen some of that reaction already from people saying that it highlights the kind of the the the, the chaos and the, the lack of planning in the Movistar team, and it is something we sometimes do um, scratch our heads a bit at their tactics. And there are certain bits in it that 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 lead one to that conclusion. I thought that that um, cutting away to shots of Max Chiandri in what would have been the second team car after Carapaz punctures, and he's just sort of staring. Uh, impassive at the road ahead you know obviously can't do anything he's miles behind where Carapaz will be Um, but it gives the impression that there's just no reaction to Carapaz puncturing which is probably a a misleading one Um, similarly the discussion about how they hadn't practiced team time trialing enough before the opening uh, before the team time trial and the opening weekend of the Tour de France and then of course the whole kind of shambles with um, uh, Mark Soler up the road in what he considered to be clearly his stage in Andorra, um, going against the the team plan and and the confusion and and even just the the sports director I think on that occasion was Arietta sort of saying oh they'll they'll criticise us for this here you know um, they're they're aware of the the criticism that the team gets obviously you get you got several glimpses of that um, but I think my overall takeaway was that. Whilst the sort of individual dramas and the individual uh, successes and failures uh, all all kind of add to the narrative of the film, the, the thing that I took away most was was one of the security that Eusebio Unzue gives the team. That the sense that um, the ups and downs are almost uh, well, they they fade in significance against the, the the context of the team having existed for forty years. And his his job is to kind of keep the plate spinning. Um, and as long as the plate is spinning, then then the the team carries on. And and you know, with when you look back at the the history of the team, Pedro Delgado, Miguel Indurain's five Tour de France titles, and and a couple of Giro d'Italia wins as well. Um, you know, over the years, they've had a lot of success. Um, he he kind of takes the the rough with the smooth with such a kind of such good grace and such um, such a sort of paternal uh, response to to the more emotional sports directors and riders that he's working with and and I found that really heartwarming and 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 actually very endearing about the whole yeah, team. Yeah, the, 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 there's a sense and and I think we got a real powerful sense of that ironically at the end from Nairo Quintana when he gave his farewell speech uh, at the end of the Vuelta and was was crying and he he recognized well he said in that speech that he could be he recognized he could be cold at times and I thought the impression I had of him throughout was of a very kind of aloof character um who I didn't really feel I, I got to know very well um and I got a real sense though of of this sense of of a family and and from Arietta as well I mean I was quite uh, struck by Arietta's emotion on the bus as well when he was talking about the, the infamous day to Toledo at the Vuelta when there was a big crash. I think James Knox went down and took Roglic and uh, Superman Lopez down and others. Uh, and Movistar had a plan in the morning to uh, 
to to basically go in the front and attack uh, coming out of that descent and they stuck to that plan um and obviously leaving behind several favorites and there was quite a lot of controversy around that and criticism and they sat up in the end and it all came back together but lopez was very outspoken at the finish about how you know it was typical of movistar and they were unsporting and all the rest of it and you know movistar put out an apology and and you move on and you kind of forget about it and you don't realize even if you're there that the people involved in that decision as well like arietta was still hurting about it, about the criticism uh, several days later, uh, which was, I found that, you know, I think what? whenever a team invites cameras in like that, they do make themselves vulnerable. But that vulnerability is what actually makes them quite likable. And, you know, the guy the guy that didn't make, that didn't come across as vulnerable in, in the series was Valverde, who, um, you know, there's a lot to admire about Valverde and uh, in in the way that he races, I mean, and his consistency and all the rest of it and he acknowledged that himself going to the Vuelta that you know it's always the Vuelta's always down to me like the last man standing um, and I, I didn't really feel like I got to know Valverde any better it just confirmed what I thought of Valverde in the first place that that he is you know somebody who lives for racing his bike just one, one little thing about Valverde that struck me two things actually I enjoyed the Unzue's teasing of him in Bilbao at the Vuelta when there'd been an early morning drugs test and uh, Valverde admitted that he was prone to get up at night once or maybe twice to go to the toilet and Unzue said that's because you're getting older. But, but um, I, I, I thought the best thing about that was that he seemed to say it, I mean the camera cut away but <laughs> typical of Unzue he seemed to say it with sort of genuine concern. It was as though it was the first yeah, time, yeah, yeah, the yeah, first yeah, time yeah. It, it occurred to him that yeah. Valverde yeah. was actually quite old now. And then at the end of the Vuelta, the very last mountain stage, the one won by Pogacar, coming off the mountain, Valverde was driving. Just driving the car. Was driving. He was driving yes. the driving, car. Yeah. And he said something like, I'm getting closer, I'm getting better. <laughs> you sort of expected him, expe- expected him clearly, to the next um, stage and, and the team turning up with him, him driving the bus. <laughs> That was a great metaphor, though, wasn't it? Valverde driving the team, the team Volvo off the mountain. I, this might be a little unfair, but I had, I had the, um, I had the impression that that Valverde was the, the the pivot around which the rest of the team goes. And I, although we didn't sort of see it, just had that sense that he would be, you know, telling Unzue one thing mm. about Lando and then telling Arietta one thing about Quintana, and just I- I- ensuring that, you know, on the on the sort of the podium of uh, priority within the team, you know, he even if he wasn't necessarily the team leader on the road, he was still kind of the the respected, uh, you know, old, elder statesman of of the riders, and I, I, that could be a very unfair um, conclusion to draw. But it was nevertheless a conclusion that the the, the film um, led me to. And I just felt really, uh, with Quintana, just um, he clearly a very introverted character, and um, he, you know, who absorbs criticism and 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 rides around with that criticism still in his mind. Mm. I, I felt, you know. He he didn't look like a sort of, you know, the the robust, stony faced rider that I had assumed him to be. From what him and Lando are both years. quite sensitive, whereas Valverde and Carapaz not. You know, and Carapaz, you know, was almost Armstrong esque in a way. I, I I was, you know, not not somebody I know very well, but he came across as just quite ruthless and single minded in the the Giro. That he won, and also in the decision to 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 move teams, you know, at one point he said towards the end, he said, "Well, I, I moved for the money," um, but then he then he sort of backtracked a bit on that and said, "Well, I'm I'm always in the shadow of uh, r- other riders here at Movie Star, which does lead one to wonder why he moved to Team Ineos." I, I, I mean, I, I think we should go on to just explain a bit the context of um, that Carapaz move and that quote in particular, because mm. you know, as I said earlier, I think it's a, it's a dangerous. Uh, exercise to draw too many conclusions about what what goes on and what has, uh, has gone on um, with Movistar sort of f- from a factual point of view um, you know it's more it's more instructive to s- just observe the characters and and um, you know think about it in those terms but you know just just talking about the the difference in characters and personalities between you know you could almost draw a line down the middle um, you've got sort of Lander and um, 
and Quintana on one hand and um, Valverde and Carapaz on the other. I mean, I just, um, you know, I, I, I thought what really came through was just those respective riders, their ability to sort of be present. And, you know, when people talk about presence and charisma, usually they're talking about a sort of gravitas or vibration that someone kind of brings to a situation. And um, they talk about when someone brings into a room, everyone can feel or sense them. But when I think about more presence, it's more in terms of someone's interaction with what's going on around them. So both in or what's going on in their body and, and also in the outside world, you, how how they are in the present moment. Um, and, you know, with, with Carapaz and, and just watching him in interviews and watching him in the race and also with Valverde, you can sort of, you can kind of see that all the lights are on and, and um, his mm. sort of nerve endings are all tingling and he's bright eyed and he's, he's reacting spontaneously with everything going on around him. He's like, um, he's sort of ready to jump out of his seat like a white tailed deer seeing a mountain lion. Um, out the corner of his eye, he's sort of he's he's ready, and and Valverde's the same. Whereas with um with Quintana, you know, there's this there's this veil, um, and I you know just watching him, I thought back to an interview that um Giovanni Visconti, who rode for Movistar for years, gave to the Corriere um, de la Sera a couple of years ago, and it got quite a lot of airplay because of a couple of quotes from Visconti. He said, um, "Nairo always wants to show he's a champion on the bike and off it. He doesn't speak to anyone." He's in his own world. He didn't even used to tell us if he had a fever. He doesn't have have friends. He just listens to the DS and he does what he has to do and he does it well. Um, but there's that moment um, during the Tour de France when the rest of the team is obviously pretty aggrieved with Quintana because they, they'd ridden for him. Um, was it the first day in the Alps? Um, or No, sorry, the first day in the Pyrenees, the stage to the Tourmalet. They'd ridden yeah. for Quintana they were all under the impression that he felt good, and then when it was his turn, basically to to um, to attack, um, he was actually doing the opposite, and he was going out of the back, um, and he'd given them no prior notice of this that he wasn't feeling good at all. And then the next day, they're on the bus in the morning, and um, Arieta sort of brings pulls him up on it, and then um, Amador does the same and you can sense that this is a frustration that's probably possibly been building or it's it's something that they've often leveled at him but the, the, the interesting thing about that I found was that he didn't even try to explain himself or he didn't even make eye contact with Amador when Amador was was um was criticizing but also sort of saying Nairo don't worry mate you know we're here for you you don't have to um, be afraid of letting us down that he, he wouldn't make eye contact with Amador and in fact he sort of looked at the floor and was just silent at that moment and I thought that was pretty telling um, of, of of this this sort of inner world that he's inhabiting and you know Quintana's someone who um, had success very very early in his career and you always feel with him he's sort of carrying the weight of a nation um, he, he's we've mentioned this before that he's this um, he's more than a cyclist. He almost has this air of this sort of Zen guru about him, this sort of mystical creature. Um, and he almost has, has internalized those behaviors and and, and um, he feels that he can't show any vulnerability. Well, that really struck me. I mean, we see the Colombian fans, they're fanatical, they're emotional. But when you see it, boiled down and clipped down to just a few seconds you you realize the intensity of those interactions you know people on the verge of tears saying thank you for everything you've done you're our hero and all, i mean that that cannot um just sort of stay on the outside of someone's personality and um i i, I felt like you know he was absorbing all of that through through um, through the film and, and it made me realize that he's probably been absorbing all of that through his whole career um and as an introvert which he you know, I don't want to do a bit of cod psychology, but clearly I've, I came away from the film thinking that Quintana would actually be much happier racing in a team of one, just taking his own responsibility for himself, um, not having others working for him. You know, he, he, see, seeing the downside of having people relying and sacrificing um, for him, whereas Landa was completely the opposite. He actually needed to know that everyone was for him and that he would be the leader. He looked very uncomfortable having to share the responsibility and not having the clarity of being uh, being the top dog. And um, two very different personalities, probably quite difficult to get them to work together um, in the team. Not not because you know it, it wasn't the sense that they they didn't get on. They couldn't get on within that 
um, within that framework, within that infrastructure, um, a, a basically an inco- but, incompatibility yeah. issue for them. And you know, you just you just feel we've we've just seen the fruits of of Quintana almost being released from Movistar. Who, let's not forget, he's ridden for them his whole career, um, and coming out and and riding for another team where um, a completely different set of circumstances. It was almost like his, uh, you know, his, you know. He, his wings have but, been unclipped. You know, it's too early possible. to say whether Quintana's move has, has worked for him, but he certainly looked like a different rider this year. And you wonder he's, whether that's... I wonder how difficult it was for him, and I wonder this more having seen the series, to, to ride with somebody like Valverde. And I, sorry for this, but I do think back to uh, Greg LeMond and Bernardino. Um, you know, LeMond, a thinker, an overthinker, uh, sensitive... Um, not introvert in that same way, but certainly somebody who was always calculating and thinking. Riding with someone like Bernardino, who was a Valverde type, he was in the moment, um, not perhaps such a deep thinker. Um, that only, it was holding up a mirror to Le Mans, but but the reflection that he was seeing was making him even worse, a more extreme um, uh, version of himself. And I wonder if that was the case with Quintana, that riding with somebody like Valverde made those those if you want to call them weaknesses but certainly characteristics traits more extreme and and less able to perform um as we know he can perform because and it links back a little bit to alberto betiol you know the the thoughts that a rider has can be uh, a help and a hindrance and uh, and if if you're sorry daniel another thing when we think about quintana um champs and, and him moving to archaea i wonder <laughs> Whether and th- this can happen that the language barrier can become a can become an advantage in the sense that um, you know what whatever sort of difficulties communicating um, which you know Quintana already appears to have had at Movistar that something wasn't quite getting through to his teammates if your teammates are ascribing that to the language barrier rather than differences in character things they don't like about you then you know they can be more sort of or better disposed towards you and more willing to work for you and and you know think more of you um you know well, the, the relationship can be on a just on a more superficial level exactly. can't it there's no there's no possibility of of getting deeper or even or arguing or, or you know disagreeing particularly we get a tantalizing sort of glimpse into the future and we, we covered the changes at the movie star team in an episode earlier this year in some detail and depth um but they've really sort of ripped things up there and they're, they're, they're they've lost landa carapaz and quintana how confident are we that mark soler is going to step into the <laughs> leader's shoes based on what we what we saw there and what what we saw particularly at the end not not particularly confident at all and I think we spoke about this a few weeks ago that just you know he's not someone that has the demeanor or has ever really had the demeanor in the last two or three years of um, a, a rider who's mature and ready for that role um, Emmerich Mass to me is someone who looks much more focused much more determined um, and and better suited to that role but Rich on the other hand um, you know, someone like Eusebio Unsue has seen everything in cycling. Um, he's managed that team for 40 years and whether he believes it or not, he, he will tell you that he does believe Mark Soler is ready. Yeah, um, I was thinking, I was going to say with when thinking about Lander, you know, he's got this, the sad eyes of someone who, you know, it's always raining in his own head, isn't it? It looks like. And with, with Mark Soler, I just think he's got, got some kind of um, wacky tune in his head the whole time. Because he didn't absorb anything from the team briefing during the, the welter, did he? He was just, you know, they were saying, right, this is the instruction. And then before you knew it, he was off up the road um, on his way to what he thought was going to be a, a stage win. I mean, quite spectacular stuff to to see uh, Arietta punching the ceiling in the team car and, and saying, you know, fucking what did you kids. Make of, um, <laughs> what did you make of Pablo Lastras? How would you like to have him in the team car oh, for the cycling baller. podcast? Oh, my God. Oh, oh wow. Um, yeah. Ice cold. I mean, mm. mafia yeah, boss. I, mean, I always know. remember David Miller talking about him. He got to know him a bit towards the end of his career and Lastras in one race had, had ridden up to Miller and thanked him for writing his book 
which was interesting. Uh, he said you, something like, you speak for all of us. Um, and he is n pretty uncompromising. There's not a lot of warmth, is there, to Lastrus? Uh, no, as I say, Mafia, but I mean, he calls, um, calls Calipas well, disloyal. Well, yeah, I mean, for, I, th I think it's you know, you're, you're dead. <laughs> you're dead to me, Richard. You're dead Just, to me, Richard. Um, I think we, we probably owe Richard Carapaz well, uh, a bit of context um, on that. And the, the documentary, I thought it was a little bit mischievous and uh, the way it used those quotes from Lastras, or Lastras saying that Carapaz was disloyal, um, obviously part of a much longer interview. And then Carapaz admitting that he had moved to Ineos for, for the money. I mean, we, we've talked about this a fair bit over the last um, 18 months or so, haven't we? Um, the situation with Carapaz. Um, he finished fourth in the Giro in 2018. Uh, I think he was on about 150,000 euros at the time from Movistar. Expected a pay rise after that, as you know you would, um, I suppose. And um, Eusebio Unzue uh, wasn't willing to give him what he wanted at that time, or give his agent the uh, the infamous uh, Giuseppe Acquadro or the pastry chef as we've called him before on the the podcast um and at that point i think aquadro who has a lot of clients at um, ineos or team sky at the time was pretty aggrieved and started speaking to ineos about carapaz moving at the end of his contract in 2019 and it seems that uh, unzue was kept in the dark about this and um and then when he did decide that he wanted to start negotiating Carapaz's next deal for Movistar so the deal that would have started in 2020 and run you know for two or three years thereafter um, he was was pretty upset to discover that Carapaz had already had some kind of agreement verbal agreement um, to go to to Ineos um, so you know you can slice and dice that in different ways uh, were Movistar wrong not to immediately give Carapaz a decent, decent pay rise um, after the 2018 Giro when he finished fourth or uh, was it underhand of Carapaz and his agent to to start negotiating with other teams um, not really sure well I think to be fair to the documentary series as a whole it did offer some context uh, regarding Carapaz's background, um, you know, very, very humble background in Ecuador, little snippets of interviews with his, um, with his parents. And I, I, I when it came round to the, to the point where even, even if that was a slight, uh, slightly mischievous twist of, of a, of a broader section of the interview, I, I didn't think, um, yeah, you, know, you know, he was he was sort of in any way money grabbing. I thought, well, you've you've won you've won the Giro, fair enough. Um, if somebody's prepared to offer you that um, salary, then well, why why not take it? Um, but you know, I, I I can see what you mean about the the way they kind of snipped it up um, and, in in that last episode. But I suppose they've they've got to make some kind of dramatic narrative. And, and I uh, suppose story. we should bear in mind you should bear, bear in mind when you're watching that who made this documentary, how it was made, why it was made. And um, the answer to that is that in 2018, the the one of the big bosses of Telefonica, the the big parent company of Movistar, came to the Tour de France for the first time. And it was the Cholet team time trial and was so impressed um, and enthused by what he saw of the team that he said to Eusebio Unzue, oh, we must, we must make a film about this, we must make a documentary, people need to see this. And um, so it, it was then commissioned really by Movistar. Um, so you would expect the documentary to show the team in a broadly favourable light. And I think I, they deserve some credit for it not having been more of a hagiography really because there are there are aspects of the film which you know do make them look fallible or um, you know bad in some respects um, and they could have been taken out and it could have been um, just a, a sort of Movistar celebration. Well, that's the documentary, The Least Expected Day, Inside the Movistar Team 2019, available on Netflix, six episodes, all fairly short, from about 20 minutes to about 40 minutes, I think is the longest episode. And, uh, well, it falls to me to give it, a, give it a rating, and I will give it four cinema hot dogs out of five, I think. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by Science.
My name's Chris Hoy. I'm a six-time Olympic gold medalist and an 11-time world champion. What I try and do is every day I'll find half an hour minimum, maybe an hour, sometimes longer if I've got the luxury of going out for a road ride, but usually an hour a day where I'll go into the gym and I'll either do a lifting session or I'll do a, like an on-the-bike um, t- a turbo session. So it's about making sure that no matter what you do, you're fueled and ready for that day because you're not at elite level anymore, but you want to get the most from that time, make the most of it. You've got so I've got so many things in my life going on that to squeeze, to sort of shoehorn a bit of exercise in the day is important to me, um, but you want to make the most of it. You're not just, you know, turning you know, turning the pedals over, you know, reading a book or, you know, watching the telly while you're on the bike. You're doing a proper interval session. You're going to make the most of it. So you want to be fueled, you know. So I take it seriously in terms of you want to be ready for the session and when you're finished, you want to recover as quickly as possible. So... Um, yeah, I'm not taking on board this, anything like the same number of calories that I used to, but I, I still do try and hydrate properly. Um, and I guess in retirement as well, you know, the one thing that I didn't do when I was competing was you know, I never drank alcohol, certainly leading up to the, a major championship. Now that I'm retired, you know, I love a nice glass of wine or a beer. If you've overindulged maybe around Christmas time, go hydro tablets or like if my mates come around the house, they're like, oh, where are those tablets you've got, the, the hydration tablets? Put that in a pint of water before you go to bed after a few beers, you wake up in the morning and you feel great. So, um, yeah, maybe not advice for high-performance cycling, but certainly for your average person, it's probably more applicable. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their continued sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast. Uh, You can get 25% off at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25, SISCP25. For all of you doing indoor training at the moment, that's a lot of you including us, uh, the SIS Hydro and Immune Bundle is recommended. Um, Keep hydrated for training indoors. Um, And get 25% off with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. This is Larry Warbass, and you're listening to Lockdown with Larry. Um, but yeah, I'm actually riding my bike right now, so quite happy to be back in the U.S. Uh, landed last night, although when I walked out of the airport uh, to about temperatures of maybe 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, I somewhat regretted my decision and thought maybe at least uh, if I was locked down in France, I could at least sit on my terrace in the sun. But, you know, here now. So I'm actually standing uh, on the shores of a frozen lake as we speak, Lake Leelna, just outside of Traverse City, Michigan, my hometown. Um, Doing a little bit more than three hours today, I guess just really because I can. Um, so I'm really feel really privileged to be able to ride my bike outside in this moment, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty peaceful. Uh, there's really not very many cars on the road. Uh, although when I left on the bike path out of town, it was actually pretty full. So um, we are currently under a shelter in place uh, here in Michigan, which yeah is equivalent to a lockdown in France, but just. Uh, yeah, a little bit more lax. So the government's actually encouraging exercise. Uh, they're telling people to go out for bike rides and uh, runs and stuff, uh, just keeping your social distance. And here it's actually two meters instead of one. So, so yeah, I'm just riding by myself today. Um, and I actually have been listening to the cycling podcast on my ride. So, you know, listening to Daniel philosophizing and you know, maybe being a little bit out there in some of his uh, analogies, etc. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been uh, enjoyable so far. Can't say I feel great. I feel pretty exhausted. I slept about four hours last night because I got home at about twelve thirty one a.m. My mom made me uh, go upstairs and change all my clothes and take a shower and essentially just fully sanitize uh, before. I did anything in the house, so, uh, you know, my family's trying to take it pretty seriously, Um, and, you know, I am too, so, so yeah, just pretty much, uh, you know, the CDC recommended to all of us who came from Europe that uh, we self-quarantine for two weeks, which means, essentially, yeah, you stay inside, but we're still allowed to leave the house 
uh, for things like exercise as long as we keep our distance from, uh, yeah, big groups and stuff. So, so yeah, getting out, getting some fresh air and, uh, yeah, getting some K's in the legs. Uh, so, so yeah, I can't, can't say I feel great cause I'm pretty exhausted and maybe it's the combination of coming down from altitude uh, lack of sleep and maybe just the mental fatigue of the general stress of this whole situation. So, uh, you know, trying to stay positive and I'm really, really glad I'm here with my family. So, uh, hopefully I'll have some more exciting updates for you guys soon. But, but yeah, I guess, uh, in general with the whole travel thing, it was actually pretty smooth. My, my flight out in East had seven people and they pretty much treated us all like royalty. Uh, we all got first class meals because, uh, they just had, uh, too many and not enough people. So, so yeah, we got, we got pretty nice treatment, but, uh, then in the UK, my flight was actually super full. So it was all the people who I think just waited till the last minute and maybe didn't really take this whole thing seriously. I wouldn't exactly include myself in that group, uh, because, you know, uh, I'm living in France most of the time, and, uh, yeah, I just really wanted to see how the situation played out there before I made any, like, big decisions. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I think I was one of the only people on the plane wearing a mask and glasses and, you know, the full full shebang. But, uh, but yeah, you gotta got to take the precautions and, uh, yeah, got home uh, safe and sound, so... Hopefully all goes well and, you know, hopefully we see some, uh, some, it starts to look up with this whole situation. So we'll see how it goes, but yeah, talk to you guys soon. So just going up the last climb of the day here. Uh, yeah, just thought I wasn't feeling that great. Then I got passed by this old man on this really old school, not that old school, like, say, 2003 specialized delay, super upright position, and he started chatting to me, keeping his distance six feet, and the car was coming, so he accelerated ahead. And he was just spinning this super high, easy gear, super easy. And I just felt like I was stuck to the pavement. He came back, dropped back. And, uh, yeah, he explained to me that for your first first thousand miles of training, uh, you need to stick it in an easy gear. And, uh, yeah, just tick the legs over before, uh, before you start pushing bigger gears and moving up. So thanks for that piece of advice. Uh, I already am well past my first thousand miles, so I guess I'll have to keep it in mind for next year. But uh, yeah, then he rode away and uh, it's more clear how slow I'm going. So, (laughs) oh well, I guess I've got a few months to build up. So <clears throat> it's March 28th. I'm just about to go to bed. Took a rest day today. No no bike. Went on just a little walk with my mom and sister. So that was pretty nice. But uh, yeah, I'd say like tension in my house is growing a bit. Um, my dad's a physician. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, today was his first day back at work after some time off. And, um, yeah, you know, so obviously, as with everywhere, there are starting, they're starting to have some corona patients there. And, uh, so it made for an interesting, uh, dinner time conversation. Um, as my dad was sitting eating dinner and we were asking about his day and, Maybe I shouldn't have brought up the subject, but I asked him if there were, uh, you know, more more patients, and he said, yeah. <clears throat> so, we'll see. I think there will be probably some new quarantine measures inside my home tomorrow. Um, but, but, yeah, so, 
that's the tough thing. Uh, you know, I think soon enough everyone will have some sort of relation to something, uh, you know, because this virus is seemingly touching everyone. So we will be... It'll be interesting to see how that develops in the next days. <clears throat> hey guys, it's uh, March 29th. Uh, you're listening to Lockdown with Larry again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so just got off a of Zwift for my second ride of the day. Um, attempted to do a ride this morning, but uh, I don't know if it was the fact that it rained last night or what but uh i ended up getting three punctures and i always uh i leave the house with two tubes always you know just in case and a patch kit so you know if worse comes to worse i'm always able to somehow get home but uh yeah that was the most flats i've ever gotten in my life in a ride so yeah i don't know if it was just there was a bunch of junk in the road or what it was maybe my tires were a little bit too fragile Um, so yeah, after, uh, the third flat and then the patch is not actually sticking. There are these new kind of patches that don't use glue, but, um, just they stick to the tire without glue, uh, normally, but they weren't sticking today. So, uh, yeah, ended up having to get picked up, came home and, uh, yeah, had a snack, got on Zwift and finished my workout. So, um actually feel okay not in such a bad mental place so guess i'll just keep on keeping on uh hope everyone is doing well and also i think it must be a sign you know it's like triple flatting maybe it's just <clears throat> that's my karma for uh getting to ride outside and uh half the world not being able to you know it's like uh gotta gotta make me work for it so ended up inside anyway just like everyone else but you know it is what it is and uh oh well (laughs) shit happens now i need to go find tubes because i don't have any more tubes (laughs) well that was larry warbass with his latest dispatch um he's back in the u.s of course as as we heard there uh, and obviously one of many riders and riders and teams coping with the lockdown or various states of lockdown in different parts of the world as the coronavirus crisis continues and shows no real sign of abating we're in the uk where it's yet certainly yet yet to reach its peak we're told and so there's no racing in sight at the moment but there is obviously news um all the time whether you know, a lot of it's just speculation, but you've got some of the the headlines from the last week, I think, Lionel. Yeah, um, well, the big news really broke after we'd recorded last week that the Olympic Games have been postponed, so won't be held this year and will be moved to 2021. And at the moment, there's a bit of uncertainty because the Tour de France 2021 would overlap with the new Olympic Games date. So we await um, a decision on that weather now that the whole calendar is being shifted they may effectively run 2021 as if it were 2020 i mean that would seem to make the most sense surely but uh, we're speculating at this stage so much of it is up in the air the tour de france this year has set a deadline of may the 15th to decide what to do we mentioned last week that there has been a suggestion that the race could be run behind closed doors with um, you know, spectators discouraged from attending the roadside and and presumably some fairly stringent controls to make sure that the the race itself was almost quarantined i mean the 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 logistics of that seem mind-boggling to me but uh, we will know in a few weeks uh, whether or not that's something that aso and uh, and i guess the french government are willing to press ahead with it's also slightly mind-boggling to me lionel that that people uh, feel the need to you know, to, to, to clamour for a decision to be made um, now. Um, I think we can all wait until May the 15th. And, you know, there are no precedents for this situation. So um, we've got no idea what the next few weeks are going to look like. And I'm I'm pretty confident that the French government and ASO won't be irresponsible um, when it comes to deciding whether to go ahead or not. 
Yeah, um, just on uh, the, the the two riders from the UAE team, Emirates team, uh, Max Richese and Fernando Gaviria, came out of hospital and headed home last week. And I think that really brought home to me um, the severity of this. I mean, obviously, these are uh, athletes at the, the, the peak of their fitness and, and yet had been in hospital um, for quite some weeks so how many weeks would that be that would be certainly over three weeks uh, recovering from the uh, coronavirus um, and then uh, team UAE Emirates osteopath Dario Marini posted on his Instagram which was then picked up by a local newspaper in Italy um, that how serious the symptoms have been for him uh, he's 38 years old considers himself to be strong fit and healthy takes part in triathlons and yet was um, was in hospital and uh, developed severe pneumonia as a result of the virus. So, you know, this, this kind of notion that we did have a little while ago that, that it was uh, more elderly and um, p- people with underlying health conditions would be the most affected you know, is not the case, clearly. Um, the two teams so far that we know from the Men's World Tour have waived uh, wages for um, staff and uh, riders to varying extents. Lotto Sudal put out a press release uh, last week and we believe Astana are doing the same. Um, uh, presumably, it's, this is you know something that I talked to Jonathan Waters about last week. You know, some team sponsors are perhaps better equipped to um, get through this period of time than others. Um, you, you look at some some of the sponsoring companies, and you would assume, just from a kind of layman's point of view, that they would be uh, their business would be severely restricted by um, the virus. Uh, or a, a company like AG2R La Mondiale, an insurance company, you wonder how exposed um, their business might be. So there's going to be some significant uh, waves created in the whole uh, of the economy um, as a result of this, and professional cycling will be impacted as will pretty much every area of our lives, I guess. Um, so that's something that we will we will watch as things develop over the coming weeks and months. Um, there's been stories about how and whether anti-doping testing should be continuing um, in the era of social distancing and, and some confusion and controversy about that. Um, I don't know, Daniel, whether you've seen any reports in the Italian or, or Spanish or French press. Uh, there are some countries or some national anti-doping bodies that have suspended all testing and others that, that haven't. Um, UK anti-doping, for example, I think said in a press release or said publicly yesterday um, that they are continuing to test. Uh, but other national agencies have said um, quite clearly that they are suspending activities at the moment. I think China was the first, and I think that was a great source of concern. Um, while um, we didn't know what was going to happen with the Olympics, um, the Chinese National Anti-Doping Authority had already said that they had suspended all testing. Yeah, a few listeners have been in touch with us asking about the implications. I mean, when initially I thought, well, hang on a minute, this is... Um, you know this this feels a little bit low down the priorities but I guess in a way um, there does need to be some kind of protocol put in place whether it's a uh, whether everyone will be able to get straight back to racing or not these are the sorts of conversations that will have to be had at some point but it does feel a little bit premature at the moment and obviously you know everybody's health and safety is um, the most important thing it has to take um, priority over collecting urine or blood samples I would I would suggest at the moment um, all the teams are also trying to keep themselves in the public eye a bit I guess um, if you keep an eye on on social media Twitter Facebook Instagram and of course uh, the, the the training tools like Zwift uh, you'll see lots of the pro teams are uh, doing things to keep their profile um keep their profile up and, and connect with um, their fans, I guess. Uh, I know that the EF Pro Cycling team has launched a calendar of online events, including uh, chats with the riders and, and Zwift rides, and other teams are um, following suit as well or doing similar things. So if, you, um, if you're if you riding on your indoor turbo trainer, you might get overtaken by a whole peloton of riders on uh, Zwift. And there are other uh, computer 
uh, game slash training tool programs available as well. But uh, Zwift does seem to be uh, the, the sort of market leader, doesn't it? That's where that where that's where the peloton are gathering. If I can just add two things, um, Lionel, a um, couple of bits of sad or concerning news to do with coronavirus. Uh, the 1980 uh, Milan San Remo winner uh, Pierino Gavazzi has been very ill and he's been in intensive care. Um, for a few days with coronavirus um, up n- in Brescia near Bergamo um, in northern Italy. Um, Pierino Gavazzi, I think we've covered the struggles of his son um, in the past, Mattia Gavazzi, who was a pro um, well up until a few years ago with some minor Italian teams and then and G- Gianni Savio's team as well. And um, he suffered from a cocaine addiction for for um, a number of years and um, eventually well hopefully overcame that but yeah his father's not been well at all but uh, Matthias said a couple of days ago that things were starting to look up but he's not out of the woods and then I've just um, learned or seen that uh, Spanish a former Spanish writer Daniel Juste or Juste um, was the only Spanish track cyclist um, at the 1968 Olympics in Mexico. He has died, unfortunately, of coronavirus. <laughs> also on coronavirus, uh, guys, of course, last week we spoke to Marco Pinotti, didn't we? Um, he is um, very much in um, the centre of, well, one of the, the areas that's been most seriously struck by coronavirus in Italy, uh, Bergamo. And um, last week, later last week, I also spoke to well, someone else from Bergamo, in Bergamo, uh, very much in the heart of the unfolding crisis there. And that was Paola Santini of Santini, the um, bike cycling clothing manufacturer, um, has been... Based in Bergamo, that company since the 60s was set up by Paola's dad, Pietro Rosino Santini. Um, and, and the family and the company are really an institution of um, cycling in Bergamo. And Bergamo is an institution in Italian cycling, as we discussed last week. Um, anyway, with the the t- terrible outbreak of um, coronavirus in Bergamo, a lot of the local companies are sort of rallying to, to try to think of ways in which they can help the um, hospitals and and doctors and Santini have come up with this fantastic initiative to convert all of their production or stop making cycling jerseys altogether and start making protective clothing and masks in particular that can be used hopefully um, in hospitals first and foremost but then also possibly by members of the public over the next few weeks Um, and I spoke to Paola Santini of Santini um, about how this came about. Uh, it was an idea we all had, both Monica and myself, but also it also came from some of our employees. Everyone wanted to do something. Um, we are in a very uh, difficult situation. It's really dramatic. Um, we are in Bergamo, so uh, this is the epicenter of, of the whole virus here in Lombardy so we actually feel this every day on our skin so it wasn't really someone having the idea it was something that everyone started to think about because we wanted to do something and where do you even start with such a thing because I mean it's a long way from making cycling I mean that the link is not would not be that obvious to most people you know the kind of fabrics and things that you use um, maybe most people wouldn't assume that you could do such a thing easily to suddenly change and pivot your production. It is a completely different world. And now that we've been doing it for pretty much a week, um, we we totally understand how different it is to produce masks instead of uh, cycling clothing. Mm, well, the link is not... Uh, probably, as you say, there is not such a great link between the two things. But, you know, in the end, um, we use fabric, we have sewing machines, uh, we have cutting machines. So in reality, we are able to uh, cut and stitch anything, really. So that's why we were like, okay, we are not as experts in this, but I think we can do something um, with some help from the experts. So that's, that's why we started. Um, we started with um, 
the idea of using a fabric that uh, it has a water resistant um, treatment, uh, which is, you know, you can breathe in, but in, in at the same time, it is water resistant. Um, so we called the fabric supplier of this fabric, which is a, a C-tip, which is in Bergamo as well. And we started uh, making some samples, some prototypes. And then we sent those prototypes to the Politecnico in Milan to be tested. Um, it was, you know, it was, we were doing everything in, in such a small amount of time because the emergency is, is here and the clock is ticking. So we needed to uh, do something and do it quickly. So we just did the sample, I think, in, in, in one morning and then sent it. Uh, and at the same time, we continued to do other prototypes and trying trying out our, our fa- other fabrics that we keep uh, asking for tests and 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 uh, confirmation from from the Politecnico. Um, it's just the only thing that we can do because we are really uh, willing to find the best solution uh, or maybe more solutions to be able to help somehow. Production is all here in uh, Lalio which is in province of Bergamo. Um, in, the fact, in, in the company, we have around 100 people. Uh, and uh, in production, we have, we have around 60 to 70 people in production. So considering that in order to make these face masks, we, cannot use, like, we, we can make use of only some of the machineries that we have. Um, we, will have le- we have less people now to work on the stitching. We have 30, around 30, 35 people now. And you said everything had to happen incredibly quickly in terms of coming up with a prototype and so forth. But mm-hmm. after five days, I think you said, are you already in a position where your masks are being used or being distributed? And who are they being distributed so, to? So we started the production of the masks on Monday. Um, Today is that's the Wednesday, first... yeah. Yeah, so three days. So that's the first prototype that we sent to the Politecnico. So that mask was, um, so the Politecnico told that 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 mask was um, a mask that could be used by individuals uh, in the community. So uh, to go grocery shopping or things like this. Um, uh, But we needed to, but the people needed to also um, keep the distance of one meter from, from each other. So it's a safety kind of, um, safety mask um, which has a certain amount of um, uh, with the treatment it has a certain amount of certainty that you don't have you, you're not going to get in contact with the virus and everything but um, it's not enough to to be used for san- uh, sanitary use basically so not for hospitals or uh, people that need to be close and to stay together with people that are sick so we are still working on that model. So we have already sent other models to the Polytechnic, uh, to the Polytechnic, and we are waiting for results. So uh, we're very positive that we will get to the point where we will have different types of uh, masks uh, that we can distribute uh, in order to cover different needs, um, the different needs of the population, but also um, hospitals and, and medical staff, basically. And how are it's, they... not, it's it's quite hard. Yeah, it's it's not as easy as it seems, and yeah. also to get the certifications and to get the product, the, the the masks tested, is not as easy as it seems. And I, I suppose that the masks, um, if they or once they are ready to to the hospitals, um, that will be a matter of great urgency, and that will happen. Yeah, um, someone will make sure that happens very quickly. But how is the how would the distribution to the public be organised? So uh, at the moment, we don't uh, sell to to, two individuals, uh, but uh, what we do is we sell to uh, companies that buy directly from us uh, to their internal use. So most of the people that are requesting from us the masks are um, companies that, as they need to keep working because, I don't know, they distribute food or um, shops uh, or supermarkets that they need to stay open for the community. Um, so they we they buy the masks from us to 
give them to their employees to be able to work, basically. Because okay. um, now, obviously, it's compulsory for all those um, supermarkets and people that keep working to use to, to make to, to use a mask. So most of the people we are distributing the mask to are those kind of um, uh, companies. Um, we have a massive amount of requests also from pharmacies and everything. But uh, for the moment, what we are able to do is to sell, but those masks are not resellable. So if we sell to a company, they will be able to use for themselves. Um, I have no idea what's, what's going to happen in case we manage to find a solution for the, the mask for sanitary use. Because I think in, in that uh, moment, we, we, we wouldn't be able to choose who to distribute it to, but it would be probably the government um, to come to us and get the masks and then distribute them to hospitals or whoever is in need. Um, And, and to be honest with you, I think it, it would be, it would be an easier solution for us as well because we have a crazy number of people calling desperate. They are desperate because they don't know what to do. And, Uh, also the responsibility of deciding who to give the masks first is is probably the worst thing you want to do of course um, it's 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 really difficult it's really tough that's why i'm i'm saying that it's so much better to do cycling clothing um very much easier yeah, yeah. even if it's a much com more complicated um product And a couple of days ago, Paola, I spoke to uh, Marco Pinotti, who has lived in Bergamo his whole life. And obviously he's there at the moment with his family. But he said, well, he's lucky in the sense that um, his family so far has been spared. And he doesn't know, he doesn't have that many friends who are directly affected. But um, he said it's a strange situation because he's sh shut away in his home and all of and this dramatic situation is playing out sort of you know in the in the houses around him but he doesn't really have much more exposure to it than someone living in the UK or, or the states reading about Bergamo but I guess for you it's different isn't it because you can feel it sort of sulla vostra pelle on your on your mm -mm. on your skin yes Um, especially because we have people calling every minute and uh, we have, uh, I personally have people I know that uh, are affected and I know people that have died already for this. Um, it's, it's, it's a really complicated situation and I am lucky because my family, my direct family has, is fine and, and we are all fine, but I know a lot of people that are not and and the numbers that you see on TV on or in the newspapers are not even close to what it, it are the real numbers. And just just finally Paula, you I mean your company is part of the sort of a great heritage as far as cycling is concerned in Bergamo and and also You know, it's, it's an example as well of a company that, well, that was a kind of typical company for of the Italian economic miracle or a manufacturing company in north of Italy that, um, you know, was what sort of modern Italy was kind of built on. Um, and a lot of those companies have suffered in the last few years. How proud are you to, to be serving the community of Bergamo at the moment? Well, of course, uh, we are proud as a family, but I think all our employees are proud and we also have to thank them because they they gave them they gave us their you know all, they were all like so proud and so willing to help that everyone said okay I'm gonna be there um I'm gonna you know keep working because I know that this is for a good cause so um this is something that's we can do because we keep we still have the production here in Italy uh, and 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 this is actually the, the the lucky part of the whole thing because if we didn't have it here in Italy we couldn't have done anything because borders are closed um, you know everything that uh, 
gets shipped too easily, gets, you know, stuck at the borders. So the fact that we have production here and people are here to work and we can also uh, do collaborations with other companies that are in our area that produce fabrics so that we keep everything here and we make sure that we can continue to produce those masks without, you know, stop one day because we don't have uh, the raw materials arriving from whatever. Um, this is this is something we're proud of. Is a, is a matter of, you know, working together. And I have to say that Bergamo in this case uh, uh, is doing a very good job. It's not only us. There are a lot of companies that maybe they don't do face masks, but they are providing uh, oxygen or anything, any other things that can be of help. Um, so I'm proud of my company, but I'm proud of my of my city and, and the people that are around. Well, that was Paola Santini of uh, Santini Cycling Clothing, um, a great initiative by them to uh, change their their production to clothing and protective masks. And Rich, a bit of an update on that. So they've had some good news. The, the masks have been approved and um, from the 14th of April, they think they will be distributed and they'll start going into hospitals and from well from that point on maybe even before they'll be producing um, they think 50 to 60 um, thousand masks a day which wow is quite a significant number wow. um and and just on santini the the clothing um has been well used by a lot of you know the great names in cycling over the years bernard tevenet bernardino um vincenzo nibli they currently sponsor trek segafredo um they also well, if you want to get hold of them i think our friends at prenda ciclismo are still still up and running at the moment i was on their website earlier and uh, i think they're still delivering um during the coronavirus crisis and um, they do a lovely selection of santini jerseys and of course um, make the official rainbow jerseys for the world champions correct well excellent um i mean as we said last week we are obviously going to cover what's happening in the world of cycling um as the coronavirus crisis carries on separately um so this is the the part of the podcast this week where we where we look at this and that that was you know fascinating to hear um from Paola Santini and uh, we'll we'll that's two weeks in a row we've heard from Bergamo which as you say Daniel's been the real epicenter in Europe but we'll continue to try and bring stories like that to you um and uh Lionel I think you have spoken to Tour Britain organizer Mick Bennett I mean they had to make an early call on the women's tour um postponing that uh, we don't know yet about the tour of britain of course which is a bit later in the year but i think you caught up with him a few days ago didn't you i did yeah let's hear um what mick bennett has to say about the situation from the point of view of a race organizer well you, you know I, I think any race organizer has a, a, um, a, a members of staff that they've had to lay off with the current crisis and we you know we've got what what you, what you could term as permanent subcontractors that we've had to lay off, but also our um, PAYE staff as well for at least for the next two to three weeks, because this thing is so unpredictable and there's, we're in unprecedented times and uh, we just don't know what is going to happen with um, the calendar uh, that 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 currently existed or exists and. Um, you know, our decision, we, we reflected the wider issues at stake, I suppose, and that um, our events take a lot of policing and emergency medical cover. And, you know, you just cannot risk um, any incident happening that would isolate a team, put, put more, puts more pressure on the emergency services, the NHS, and uh, for an, an indeterminable amount of time. And... Um, it's it's a real we're, we're backed right into a corner here and we want the very best for the health of the country it's not just about the bike race and when you looked at the edict i think that the uci gave out about two to three weeks ago basically on the cusp of when we announced i think it was the 14th of march that we were 
postponing um, the the women's tour, uh, at, and we were we were postponing the tour series as well, with a view to running the tour series later in the year. Um, there was a, an edict where the UCI recommended that organisers separate the the audience the spectators from the the podium by a hundred metres and the finishing straight for the last three hundred metres. Well, it was just it's just impossible to impose those sorts of restrictions and regulations on an organizer when we have uh, you know the, the the women's tour for example has a a very high health and well-being agenda and uh we bang that drum loud loudly and that's why the local authorities signed up so we could promote this health and well-being agenda within the local authority and to actually put them under more pressure um uh, would be uh uh, nonsensical and that's why we took the decision to postpone um to later in the year so as a race organizer when you when you see people kind of speculating that you know the the, the classic could be held in the autumn and maybe the giro in october and 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 with the latest story from le parisienne um overnight that the idea that the tour de france could go ahead but just without any publicity caravan or spectators, almost a sort of ghost Tour de France. I mean, without kind of speculating too heavily, what do you make of of, the, of those kind of uh, suggestions? Because to me, it seems uh, it seems slightly fanciful. Well, absolutely, absolutely correct, and that's the right word to use. It is fanciful. You, there's no way you could do it in this country. As I said earlier, the very reason that we hold these uh, we hold the tour of Britain and the women's tour is because we take it to the public. And when you try to shield the public from the event, you're just defeating and you wouldn't get a local authority that's going to sign on the dotted line to not only fund that particular stage, but to also put, put their resources um, uh, to the event in order to uh, promote it to nobody. And I think without without trying to criticize another organizer i think it was irresponsible of uh, of aso to go ahead with paris nice and just have basically for the sake of the, the the riders that had rocked up to ride and to hold it i genuinely thought that paris nice wouldn't see see itself through to the end which it did of course and then um and then uh, I, I think at the same time the UCI put that edict out about you know no no nobody near the podium nobody within 300 meters of the finish line, and um, well, I don't know. Well, uh, Paris Nice, yeah. um, Paris Nice, of course, finished one day prematurely, didn't it? Um, it did kind of it technically reached Nice, of course, but didn't didn't yeah. go into the Sunday as as scheduled. Um, I mean, these must be difficult times for you as a as an event organizer and for race organizers. Um, in every region that is affected, is, is it a case now of, of 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 trying to sort of survive this period, this uncertain period, and um, and, and and ensure that there's there's something to bring back when the time is right to bring it back? Well, we're hoping that if um, we're we're rather hoping that um, we can bring this postpone it until the end of the year, whatever slot the UCI. I know they sat yesterday. I think there was a, a Cobra Stroke Council of War meeting that the UCI held to look at the calendar um, for the latter part of this year, see what they can cram in. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're hoping that we can roll what work we've already done, and we've done an awful lot um, through to 2021. And remember, all of our detail and our event management plans have to be ready a month before the event um, so that would have brought us to the end of April, uh, for, certainly for the women's tour. So for the men's tour, we've got to have everything ready by the end of July, early August. And um, all this hard work that, that myself and the team and the commercial team have done, uh, we hope we can roll forward to 2021, given that we already have contracts with some local authorities for 2021, that weren't getting um, contracts this year. Right, of course. So there's a there's a, a jigsaw puzzle to be put together, I guess, with with uh, the 2020 um, 
stage towns and finishes and then the, the ones you've already got in place for 2021. Correct. That's absolutely right. And when you when you think that, that you know, one of the UCI regulations is you can't have more than a two hour transfer between the end of one stage and the start of the next, it becomes mm-hmm. one hell of a conundrum. Do you think that, um, you know, looking looking more widely, I mean, do you think that there will be some race organisers that, that, that don't manage to weather this? Um Oh gosh, I wish I I wish I had the the, the an answer to this. I would imagine so. When you think that there are uh, a lot of these race organisations like us are, are runners companies, um, we have a bottom line that we've got to look at um, that, that to keep us going or staff to employ. They have the same situations, and I assume you're talking international here, not volunteer domestic yeah. promoters in in the UK. Um, then I'm certain whether they I'm certain they'll struggle to weather the storm because um because of this confounded situation and I just hope above hopes that um Italy um manage to keep this under control and it starts to drop off because I know Italian um Italian um promoters are struggling as well I mean look you know the Giro for example that's that's postponed effectively but in terms of uh, yourself, you know, we're we're looking. I mean, it's a, it's an odd situation, isn't it? We're we're kind of um, lamenting the loss of bike racing, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter. But when we're all confined to our houses, suddenly we 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 do start to appreciate the things that we uh, that we enjoyed and are currently going to be missing. I mean, how will you how will you kind of uh, get get through potentially six months of the season without? any bike racing to watch well it, 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 it's a good question um uh, i I'm, I'm hopeful that this thing is going to start to um, uh, subside round about the end of july something like that which gives us you know august september august to um, we've, we're already well ahead of the curve on the tour of britain um all of our stakeholders are in position of course, they're asking questions uh, if this continues, how are we going to manage it? But we are well down the road with for this year with the Tour of Britain. And um, I, I hope and pray that uh, it can go ahead because we've done basically all the work is basically finished on it. How would you feel if it was, you know, running at the same time as, you know, the the classics or as the the, the Giro d'Italia or whatever? Because presumably everyone who has had their event postponed because of the virus is is going to want to get back on the calendar as soon as possible. So there's going to be some negotiations to be had, I guess. Or will will events that um, that could could have gone ahead as normal take precedent? It's a big question we don't know the answer to at the moment. No, it's not, and I haven't got the answer to, but. I know that in the past, you know, uh, for many years, we clashed with the two events in Montreal, the two world tour events in Montreal and the Vuelta. Um, and this year, I think we were clashing with um, the Bink Bank Tour uh, as well as those other events. And, you know, we've got a great British public out there and they come out and support the Tour of Britain as they do the women's tour. And... Um, I think they'll see the Tour of Britain when we come out of this as a celebration that we've come out of this confounded COVID-19 and come to the roadside and enjoy the spectacle. Well, the overall sense from Mick Bennett there is that it's still very early to know um, how the professional cycling calendar will be put back together after all this is over. Um, suggesting that the Grand Tours and the Classics would maybe be given precedent, but no indication at the moment as as to whether events are on the calendar later in the year that aren't directly impacted by the, the coronavirus lockdowns would be able to stay in their current slots. And really, I guess, a slight sense of frustration that there isn't, uh, you know, there, there aren't the discussions going on in cycling that perhaps are going on in, for example, Formula One or Premier League football. It seems to me that they, there's no way they can make a definitive decision about what the response will be because we don't know the, the date that things will be able to 
return to some sense of normality. But it does seem to me that, that perhaps the race organisers should be looped into the conversations at this point so that some theoreticals can be discussed behind closed doors. I think I said last week, I'm not particularly interested in seeing the publication of, uh, you know, fantasy race calendars of what could and couldn't be done um, to, you know, salvage from this season, how late into the year racing could go on. Um, you know, all of these discussions do feel at the moment slightly uh, the sort of thing that, that really are for the UCI, the race organisers and the teams to put their heads together to discuss rather than something that it's yeah. particularly constructive us um, speculating about because we, we simply don't know. We may have some racing in August, September, October. We just don't know. It's just going to be very difficult to squeeze everything that's been postponed uh, into what remains of the season um, and I'm well I've said it before but I just hope that there's some sense of common sense when it comes to uh, trying to salvage as, as much as can practically be done in the uh, later part of the year. Uh, lots of speculation about race calendars and so forth Lionel but also speculation about uh, friends of the podcast and in particular Chiro a lot of concern about Chiro. Chiro, of course, is in um, one of the epicenters of the outbreak, um, which is Milan uh, in northern Italy. And of, of even, well, of equal concern um, is the well documented fact that Chiro can't cook or won't cook, more like won't cook, um, very proudly um, agnostic or, well, he's more of a, a culinary atheist, in fact, isn't he? Um, well, certainly when it comes to actually making his own food. Um, I have asked Chira about this. Um, I was also concerned, and he assures me that there's a lovely um, delicatessen just around the corner, which has been making him uh, pre pre cooked meals, and he goes in there every day and he picks up his meals. and um, I think he can heat food. Um, he certainly can't cook. Um, and on Sundays, as a treat for himself, he gets a takeaway pizza. But he's fine. He's in good spirits. Um, it's tough times for the Gazetta, though, because mm. um, you guys probably know this. Um, the Gazetta is, well, it's the most read newspaper in Italy. And it's read by about three million people every day. But um, every copy is, is read by, on average, about 20, 25 people. Um, and that usually happens in bars. And all the bars are closed, of course. Um, so not too good for their... For their circulation figures at all and people are worried about the virus being spread on paper and so on so newspapers are really suffering you know as you say public places closed but um fewer people also obviously able to buy a paper or have or, or get one delivered so um yeah very tough times and i think uh you know in all the focus on digital people have forgotten that newspaper sales are still a big part of a, a newspaper's business so and for a, a sports paper like gazetta or l'equipe as well it's you know it's it's yeah it's a tough period um we should wrap things up chaps um we've got a few thank yous to friends of the podcast before we go but after hearing our thank yous, we'll hear again, we heard from him a bit earlier, Francois Tomaso. Uh, he obviously heard our bit in last week's podcast on Gianni Mura, the great Italian uh, writer who died last week. Um, and Francois knew Gianni Mura very well and um, from the Tour de France. And he wanted to pay his own little tribute with a memory of Gianni Mura as well. So we'll hear from Francois again after our thank yous to to some of you who've signed up as friends of the podcast and you can do so at the cyclingpodcast.com we're very grateful to all of you who've signed up um your support is much appreciated so my thanks to daniel norton simon hill talib yassin remy dota sheldon tyson mike mutri maxwell moon annette ment conrad is at and billy murray and a big thank you from me to Andy Wright, Lindsay Davidson, Ian Richards, Will McAlpine, who I know in real life. Hello, Will. Hello, Kerry. Bill Murray, John Armstrong, Rich Street, Neil Corsi, Dagmar Jungens, and Richard Trieger. I think we had Bill Murray Trigger. twice there, chaps. It's like Groundhog Day listening to you two. Oh, <laughs> oh we did have Billy Murray we twice. We did as well. Yeah, we yeah. did. And Maybe there are two Billy thanks. Murrays. A big thanks from me to Malcolm Riddle, 
Tushar Mordzadia, Sasha Timkovic, Simon Thomas, Andrew Safransky, Fee Wavrin, Stephen Shear, Vicky Thomas, Larry Grossman, and Dave Parnell. Richard, does the name Fee Wavrin ring any bells? It should do, because in 2014, she very kindly invited us to have uh, dinner and stay at their place in the Dordogne after oh, the yes. Perigo to Bergerac time trial, Beautiful just before place. you bailed out and left me with the long drive up to Paris because you were going to the Commonwealth Games, I think. Um, but we had an extremely good meal, didn't we? Um, it was a real highlight of the tour. Uh, mm. and, and it ended our 2014 tour on a very high note. So, thanks, Fee. Uh, thank, thanks for being a friend of the podcast, Fee. That reminds me, Napalm, I, I did intend to speak to you about the, the pasta wars going on in Italy, um, about the uh, penne, whether you should be eating smooth penne or um, you know, penne rigate, penne with lines, but that's um, something for another day, I think. You can't get any pasta here. It's all sold out in the UK I don't know so I'm not bothered I mean I'd have I'd just have a one lasagna sheet with the sauce piled on top that would that would do at the moment we're Rich. still recording here I think take the bales <laughs> Rich in we go close of play hi guys this is Francois Tomazo from Marseille locked down in, uh, in Marseille um, I know you probably well I know you did paid uh, a deserved tribute to uh to the later uh, Jani Mura in the in the latest episode, and I wanted to share my experience of Jani with you guys because it's uh, you know he's someone I yeah I I came across quite a lot of times uh, in my uh, experience on the Tour de France because as you, as you said probably as I as you thought and as everybody knows uh, Jani was really a fixture of the tour of the press room everybody knows of his presence his massive presence and. Uh, you know the guy who used the typewriter almost until the very end uh, in the press room and uh, in the press room and you know it, it gave this little little noise of nostalgia in the press room the you know this kind of a old school approach to uh, to our trade by refusing to yield to uh, the the age the of computers and uh, digital anyways they the, the the oddly enough or not um the, the the places where I met uh, Jenny uh, most often on the Tour de France were restaurants, <laughs> because for Jenny, Jenny was more of a of a football journalist, and uh, uh, his love of of cycling mainly uh, was a love of the Tour. And um, well, maybe Danielle would object to that, but Jenny was a perfect gastron you know gastronomist, a guy who really loved food. Well, he loved French food and he loved French cuisine. I think probably better than the Italian cuisine. Well, that's the that's the way it is. Um, and so every time we were, uh, I was on the tour very very often. I was picking the best restaurants on the on the on the tour route, and um, I would I would you know bump into well literally <laughs> bump into Jenny, and um, well he was uh, you know was a, he was a favorite. He was a he was a local almost at Le Viscos, my, as you know, my and our favorite uh, restaurant on the Tour de France at the foot of the Tourmalet. And every every time he had a chance to get there, uh, well, I, when we when we arrived uh, when we arrived at the Viscos, most of the time we found Gianni and his driver already all uh, set up for a, a nice meal and a long uh, a long dinner. But I remember a, a special instance um, that was in the. French Basque country. I can't remember the year it was, but it was about fifteen years ago, I think. Um, and the best uh, restaurant around was in a place called Biriatou. And um, well, of course, when we arrived at the restaurant, since it was the best restaurant in the area, uh, when we came there, um, well, uh, Gianni was already there at the table finishing his dinner because I mean, uh, Gianni spent more time. <clears throat> Eating and having dinner, than writing stories. Even though he wrote some of the greatest stories on the on the sport and on the tour, and so when we got to that restaurant in Biriatou, <coughs> there we found Gianni sitting at his, at his table with the driver. Uh, it was fun because I remember that year he was he was driving around. He was driven around by this driver in a small in a little Topolino, the small Fiat's, it, which, which was almost a carbon copy of Gianni himself. You know those those little Fiat's. <coughs> Um, and I, I, I can't rem well. I, I can't 
figure out how he managed to get into the car, but he did. And uh, talking of the driver, he, he was a, his faithful driver who stayed with him for years. And, and that driver actually died of liver problems. Well, guess why? Anyway, uh, we arrived in a restaurant and Jenny was there. He was finishing his meal. And in front of him, there, there were three big glasses of spirits of some sort. And so I, 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 I walked uh, over to Jenny and said, oh, Jenny, how are you doing? But well, you you're having three digestives, and he said, "Ah, oh, well, you know, uh, I looked at the menu, and there were three different brands of Armagnac. I just couldn't choose, and so he had the three glasses. That was Jenny Mora to me. Okay, bye, guys." You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Listener.